and welcome to First Presbyterian Church this last day of August, uh, last Sunday in August. Um, as we gather together uh, here in the sanctuary and at home, let us come together as we come to worship and praise God. Let us ask for his presence to be with us as we hear words from Psalm 103. Hear the words of the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. Amen. Sunday school class, <clears throat> a new Sunday school class begins September 10th. And it's a video class geared for second grade through adult with a trip through the Holy Land. And it's exciting to be having a new curriculum about that, so we invite all of you to September 10th, begin Sunday school at 9.30 in the, sanctuary, in the fellowship hall. If you are interested and have not already picked up a hymns of faith or an old pew Bible, your last opportunity is now, either get them in the back or, or the front. Um, also, envelopes are in the back and in the front if you choose to donate to the new hymnals uh, in honor of someone, or in memory of someone, or just choose to give a donation for the new hymnals. Um, if you're interested in attending the Messianic service celebrating Rosh Hashanah, which is the middle of September, September 16th, contact Janet to carpool. It is a Saturday um, for their Rosh Hashanah celebration. Also, I wanted to um, thank Leslie, who's not here. Um, and I know she spoke last Sunday on Street Fair, but without Leslie, Street Fair would not happen. And we just, and all of the special people who work with her to make it happen, um, but it's a tremendous effort, and we owe her a great deal of uh, gratitude for her efforts. So if you see her, give her a special thank you. Also, Linda has asked me to announce that on Thursday of this week, August 31st, all those who are participating and helping with Good News Club to meet in the fellowship hall at 6.30 um, to be prepared and get prepared for Good News Club starting in October. Uh, are there other announcements? Hearing no other announcements, let us prepare our hearts with thankful uh, hearts and minds as Marcia plays the prelude.
Let us open with prayer. Holy Spirit, you are present here. Jesus, you are present here. Father, we know your presence in heaven through Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the blessing of the soaking medley of music that calls to our minds holy words that allows us to immerse ourselves in preparation to join in worship with each other today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wasn't that lovely? Wow, I, it was hard to get up and speak. I just wanted to sit in it, Marsha, and go, could you play it again, Marsha? It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, do it again sometime at least. So I would ask us now to stand. Marsha has invited us into worship. Be called into worship and join your voices in a responsive reading from Psalm 33. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. Let us open with hymn number 591, asking the Lord, praying for the Lord to have thine own way.
O oh Lord, we confess that not all of us are turned over to you, and so we turn over our hearts and minds now as we stand here and silently confess our individual sin before you and then unite in a prayer of unity for confession. Together we pray, forgive us, Lord, that we do not consider everything we do. Transform our hearts, remolding them to conform to your will. Amen. Let us be assured in a responsive reading, hear the good news. Who is in the position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ prayed for us. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Let us call in unison for God's word. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? O oh Lord, we ask again today, as we do each time of gathering, for you to bring forward your word to us, a word that we may have heard before in the passage that is read, or maybe not. But even if it is a familiar passage, Lord, we ask that through your spirit, we are able to receive whatever new thing, a new song, a new way that you may have for us to live into. And if it is an old song, help us to reiterate and echo what your word has cried out throughout the years. Thank you, Lord, that your word never fails and your steadfast love endures forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I would have you open immediately to our major scripture reading, which begins on page 1586 in your pew Bibles. A reminder that last week we left off with Paul making his journey to Jerusalem. Just as Jesus had done at the final part of his life, he made a final journey into Jerusalem too. At that point, last week, Paul had not yet arrived. In today's passage, we see his arrival. And when he arrives, he meets with three groups of people. I'm not going to read the entire passage, but I want you to turn to page 1586 and take note that at his arrival, the first persons that he meets with, moving through verse 26, are fellow believers, those who are in alignment with Paul and the faith. So that's the first group. The second group begins at verse 27. They are the ones who want Paul to come under arrest. They are opposed to Jesus, and they are opposed to Paul. When he meets with this group, then he has an occasion to come in contact with a third group, which are the Roman officials, the commanders, the soldiers, and um, those who are to keep the Roman peace, the Pax Romano. We're picking up our reading at verse 30, so please follow along with me. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. 
When the riders saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Stop there for a moment. Why did they stop beating Paul? Well, pardon me? It was. It was illegal. They knew they were doing something wrong and they were getting caught by the Romans who were the holders of the law. So they stopped beating Paul. So let's see this pattern if it continues on, this idea of distinguishing between what's legal and what's not. So picking up at verse 33, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 10,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? So let's stop there. So there's a case of mistaken identity. The commander does not know who Paul is. He thinks this crowd is so upset he must be the Egyptian terrorist who led a revolt. And that's why there's such a riot going on in the city now. But he finds out that's not who Paul is, and the people know who Paul is, but he does not. So, verse 39, Paul answered, I am a Jew. From Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Take that in, a citizen of no ordinary city. You'll see, that is our takeaway today a citizen of no ordinary city. Paul mentions first his city of birth, Tarsus, calling it um, a no ordinary city and that he is a citizen of it. But he doesn't stop there. On verse 40, he says this, after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, brothers and fathers, now listen to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. So we're gonna stop this portion of the reading here. So now there's another city mentioned. This city meaning Jerusalem. So two cities have been mentioned. Paul was born a citizen of Tarsus, but now he is a resident and therefore a citizen of Jerusalem. Those of you who live here in Pataskala, are you citizens of Pataskala? Those of you who live in Pickerington, are you citizens of Pickerington? You have rights to vote and you have certain rights, right? Well, that's what was going on is citizens have certain rights and if you violate the rights, it is, as Susie said, illegal. So Paul is standing up and establishing his rights as a citizen, but it's even more extreme if we move into the passage after he makes his defense and his case before the people, his own people, his fellow citizens in Jerusalem. He makes a case not for himself. Remember a couple weeks ago, we heard he wants to finish well and complete the task. He does not defend himself for his survival. He defends himself to bring glory to Jesus, to speak about Jesus. That's the purpose of his defense. And we can see this when we pick back up, move now to the next page of chapter 22, verse 21. For he says this to the people who are listening and the commander here hears it too. Then the Lord said to me, that is the Lord Jesus, Go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. 
As they stretched out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? You think they were breaking the law before? When it's against a Roman citizen, which his fellow citizens in Jerusalem knew he was, he had not even received justice, a fair trial. He had not been pronounced guilty. It was not right for the people to be punishing him, even the Romans, because as a Roman citizen, he had rights. As a foreigner in the city citizen, he didn't have rights back then. But as a Roman citizen, he did. Again, though, the reason he sticks up for his rights is not for his own life, not for his own concerns, but the concern of Jesus Christ. Let's continue on to verse 26. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me. Are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So not only was the mob, rioting mob, realizing that they were doing something illegal, now the Roman commander, the soldiers, and the centurion realize the same thing, that they are violating Paul's rights as a Roman citizen. Now Paul is claiming his citizenship of places on the earth, of the cities in which he was born and where he lives, but also the empire, Rome. It would be like we say we're citizens of Pickerington, we're citizens of Pataskala, we're citizens of Granville, wherever it might be, but we're also citizens of the United States of America. We have different levels of citizenship, and that's our physical location. But being a citizen of no ordinary city may be beyond that it's a city beyond the physical. Even though Paul doesn't speak of this, because of his purpose of fighting for the rights, he's fighting for the rights of Jesus, the king, whose citizenship is heavenly. This premise of there being two different parallel existences of heavenly and earthly is a theme throughout the Bible. The heavenly existence is higher than the earthly one. And ultimately, Paul is citing his rights as earthly citizen for the sake of the heavenly citizenship. Let me explain what I mean. I noticed today in Fellowship Hall, I don't know if you looked at the bulletin board there, Linda has this excellent timeline of from the beginning of time, moving on until the end of time. And at the time when Jesus came, there's a period between now and then of 2,000 years, and it ends with, it says on that bulletin board, a new, new heavens and a new earth. How did the Bible begin? This is the first verse I taught my children to remember. You might know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see that? There are two parallel existences, the heavens and the earth. And at the end of the Bible, if you would open your Bible to um, Revelation 21, you would hear that at that time when Jesus comes, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Following that portion in the Bible, it also tells us there's going to be a new city, a new Jerusalem. So there's this parallel existence. I've been learning spiritual formation in this 
book that I'm using, and it talks about this parallel paradigm and how we need to realize, and this is our takeaway, that we put our citizenship in heaven above any of our citizenship on earth. And when we exercise our earthly rights, that it should always be for the sake of our citizenship in heaven, for the sake of Jesus, for his name's sake, for the king of heaven. So if you look in your bulletin, it shows you how from the beginning of the time, we already mentioned the start of Genesis. Also in Genesis, there's the story of Abraham and Sarah. Kathy and I just went to worship at the Messianic congregation, and it was talking about Abraham and Sarah. And when they were asked by God to leave their country, and this is in the book of Genesis, but referred to in Hebrews 11, 16, read that out loud with me what it says. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is talking about the new heaven and the new Jerusalem. Thank you, by the way, for allowing me to go back to my place of birth into Pennsylvania. While I was there, I met with one of my friends um, that I had met when I was in college. We didn't go to college together. And she had always said to me, would you go with me to Jerusalem? I wasn't yet a pastor. She wanted to go to Jerusalem. She wanted to visit the holy city of Jerusalem. And I said, I don't care about going to Jerusalem. She said, why? And I said, that's the old Jerusalem. There will come a time when Christ comes again that I'm going to be eternally in the new Jerusalem. I don't need to go to the old Jerusalem. Now, you know I went. That was because I got a special deal to get there for $600. But originally, I didn't care whether I went or not because I'm putting stock into the heavenly city, not into the earthly city. Also in Hebrews, it speaks in a more general way besides Abraham, Sarah, for all of us who are believers. Let's continue with the second quote in Hebrews 13, 14. Read that with me. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. What is here? Here is the old Jerusalem. Did the old Jerusalem endure? It seems like it did because it still exists today, but has it always been there? No. When Abraham and Sarah were going there, it wasn't, didn't even exist yet. And then there came a time when the Assyrians captured Jerusalem and the Babylonians, and the city was completely demolished. The temple was demolished. The people were exiled into Babylon, Babylon and there was no city at all. It was gone. They came back, and then after Jesus had died, the city was once again destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. The city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. No more temple. Is there a temple now in Jerusalem, a full temple? No. It doesn't exist. The city has been rebuilt, but the city got destroyed again. The nation got destroyed at the time of World War II. The nation was entirely annihilated. It wasn't until... 1967, Linda was talking about this. She had a roommate at this time when she was in college. The war of 1967, Israel came to be again a nation. Jerusalem was established. But is the capital any longer in Jerusalem? No. The capital of Israel is in Tel Aviv. It does not even have prominent importance. It is not an enduring city. What is the enduring city? The heavenly one. The new Jerusalem. So we have more about this in Philippians. Let's read this quote together. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember we talked about Jesus too was making his way into Jerusalem, and he was having to defend himself between government before the Roman officials. He appeared before Pontius Pilate. Do you remember this? And when he appeared before Pontius Pilate, Jesus too claimed citizenship. He was human. He was born in Bethlehem. He lived in Nazareth. He moved to Galilee, but he never talked about any of his earthly citizenships. 
When Pontius Pilate asked him, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Which citizenship did Jesus claim? The earthly one? No, the heavenly one. And yesterday we went and met with our messianic friends. As the body of Christ Jesus here on this earth, we also have a heavenly citizenship and not just us who are part of the Gentile church, but in union with Jewish believers. This is from Ephesians 18.22. Let's read this final quote together. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of the household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. You see, if we're like the Egyptians who that led the terrorist attack, there would be in that time no rights to foreigners and strangers. But we're not foreigners, strangers. We are citizens of the heavenly city that exists in heaven and that will come down when Jesus comes. Do you believe this? Do you live into it? Do you look to it? Do you put your sights and your allegiance first there? That's what our takeaway is today. And this is part one of the message. Part two is coming as I call the children forth. So I'm letting Susie be one of the children and, and Emily's going to come down too to help with the children's message. So bear with that. Do we have a microphone back here? Christians is to Christ. 
and that the Christian flag should be first and foremost. And so he began to buy for that to be the case and for the protocol to be changed. And by the early 1940s, it was. Do you notice anything at the front of the congregation different? Because I had to look up the protocol. It used to be that when we were on the screen, we always had the American flag by the pulpit and it could be seen. Now the Christian flag is there. The American flag is on the other side because the prominent right hand is always prominent. So the Christian flag has prominence, whereas the American flag is second. Not that we shouldn't care about our nation, right? Anyone scouts? God and country, right? God is first, country second. Anyone a Marine? God, country, and core, right? God is always first. So, in case you're wondering, don't switch it back. That's, that's what it's supposed to be now in the protocol. I did a big study for today, and I corrected it. So, let's talk about, you got one of the little Christian flags, Emily? What parts are on here? What do you notice first? The white. What do you think the white might stand for? Yes, she said how he washes. She knows from Good News Club. The white washes us holy and pure because God is holy and pure. He washes us white, holy and pure. Why does he have to wash us? Because we have sinned. What is it that washes us? What color is the blood? Notice anything else on that? The actual cross is red. So the red blood of Christ washes us white. And these are colors that are part of Good News Club. Linda and all you teachers for Good News Club, Emily knows all this through you. Thank you so much with the colors. But there's no blue in the Good News Club, is there? Huh, what are some of the other colors in the Good News Club, the word was called? Is there anyone we're missing? We talked about dark being sin, the red, yellow, green. I think the yellow and green are the yellow. ones up. So like the gold, which is God being holy and pure, making us holy and pure. Green is a combination of two colors. Yellow and blue. The blue stands for the baptismal water. The waters of baptism that also, with the cross, notice it's surrounding the cross. The waters of baptism through the Holy Spirit also represent, Christ washes us white as snow. But the waters represent that washing as well. So this is the baptismal water. And from the baptismal font, we're supposed to start our faith and continue to grow. What's the color of growing? Green, which is a combination of what two colors? So you have now been educated on the Christian flag, but you're not just going to be educated. We have a new song that we're going to be singing today. It's number 600 in your, your um, green hymnal, but we're going to have Emily and Susie pass out to you a Christian flag that you can hold up as you sing this song, I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb. And when you're done passing them out, we're going to put one of the buckets here in the front, one of the buckets in the table in the back, so as people leave, you'll deposit the flag, but next week we're going to have to use them again. But hold high your flag, and we're going to pass those out. Go ahead and pass them out with the buckets. I'll let you know when they're ready. No, let's let, let everybody get their flag. We'll be patient. If there's anybody that doesn't have a flag, hold up your hand without the flag in it. Joyce and Ken need a flag. So, Susie, Joyce, and Ken need a flag. She's coming. Melissa's not forgetting her mom and the people in the balcony. The flag's flying high. 
All right, with that being said, if you'll stand with flag in hand, hymnal in hand, and we're going to have Kathy, since it's the first time we're singing it, she's going to introduce the song. It's very easy. It's very short. Kathy, would you help lead us in I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb? citizens of heaven so you have sung the allegiance you may be seated and remember to deposit your flags we'll use them again next week another time we'll use the flag is when we have our procession on founders day what a great flag for us to be able to carry so we have plenty of them ordered for that as well let us move into prayer and thank you emily great Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for sending your son, living son of the living God, living word. We pledge allegiance to your son, to the lamb who is triumphant upon the throne with the flag of victory over him. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done through your son, for son and giving up your life, that we are covered with your blood, that we are cleansed and holy and pure, though not finished yet, that your spirit is still working, that the baptismal journey that has begun will continue to grow us in the faith and living as you would have us live. Lord, we thank you for all the beautiful things that you have done in our lives, for newness and new births, for anniversaries that we celebrate, for your spirit that just revives the faith within us. We do pray for the citizenships that we have here on this earth. We pray for our nation. We pray for the state of Ohio. We pray for the local governments. We pray for those that you have put in position, like the commanders and the soldiers that were there in the Roman times. We thank you for the military, the police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and others who protect us. We pray for leaders besides in government, those in health and education, business, and the church. We pray for your gospel to spread throughout the world, to the far ends of the earth, Jesus, as you said in Acts 1.8. We pray for Israel, for we are brothers and sisters with the Messianic Jewish believers. We pray that the faith of Yeshua will spread throughout all of the Middle East, all throughout Asia, throughout all of the continents. We pray for missionaries who suffer persecution. We pray for our local community, O oh Lord. We pray as school has started, that transition of getting back into the rhythm of school is a difficult one. We just talked about that in Sunday school today. Be with the parents and the students who are trying to get back in step. We pray for Good News Club, for the meeting that's coming up on Thursday. We pray for the new people who are stepping forward and excited about teaching and being with the children and showing your love to them, it is indeed good news, the best news 
of all. We pray, Lord, for agencies that you have planted among us in our community. We thank you for the meeting that we had with those who oversee outreach, who want to continue support for Heartbeats, for the Jesus, Jesus Storehouse, for the Kids Eat Free Summer Program, for the Look Up Center, for Starting Strong, for approval for collection to be taken next month as it was last year for those children who have aged out of the foster care system and are in a dangerous point in their lives that we can supply for them to begin an adult life under your care. We pray, Lord, for a blessing of that time and that our hearts will be moved to answer it. We also pray for there are youth who have been subject to the awful condition of human trafficking. We pray for Grace Haven. We pray, Lord, for those who are victims of natural disasters, those in grief. We think especially of the bus accident on the first day of school in Springfield that left over 20 children injured and one dead. We pray for the community there and for the families suffering this loss and grief. We pray for families here like the Beckners and the Terrys who are remembering the loss of Daniel Jr. nearly a year ago on September the 4th. We lift them up. We pray for those who are not mobile, who are not able to be with us, who are online and we just greet them with love, part of our fold. We pray for our continued pastoral care for them and they're listed in our bulletins and they have various needs. We pray for those who have chronic conditions of anxiety, depression, cognitive or mental issues and for their caregivers. We pray for those who are dealing with cancer. We think of Jim Charles who's undergoing treatments again and will have a scan in October. We think of Randy Conway who needs discernment after um, the, that will come on on the 29th this week concerning his bladder and prostate. We think of Dick Lord's sister, Darley, who awaits removal of the kidney because of her cancer. Robert Holland Sr., who is having lung radiation. We pray for Jenny Horn, for Linda Long. We pray for Susan, Jim Hall's sister, who's in comfort care and awaiting potential surgery. We pray also for June Conrad, Tammy's mother-in-law in hospice. For those who are um, receiving a waiting period for heart, we think of Leslie's brother, Ron. For Frank, who's awaiting results for his monitoring in October. We thank you for results of Elaine, who you have just been with repeatedly for her heart. We thank you that now not only is she in rehab, she is home. And we pray that you will continue to be with her. We pray for Jean Johnson, who had surgery of her gallbladder removal, but is in pain and is not able to be with us today. We know, Lord, before we have started praying for all these people and needs, you have been in prayer. And you have taught us how to pray as citizens of your kingdom of heaven, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to a time of stewardship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he planted on the earth the first citizens, Adam and Eve. And he made them stewards, saying, you have dominion over the earth. That has been passed on to us. We are to be stewards as well. Let us consider this role that God has given. Let us consider our citizenship, not just our rights, but also the benefits that we have received. 
and respond in great gratitude with the offering that we bring as we listen to Marcia pray. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as citizens of your heavenly city and kingdom, we have responsibilities of stewardship. Help us to not just pledge our allegiance, but live accordingly, to adhere to the call that you have given us. Help us to listen to your spirit when he prompts us to show our gratitude for all that you have provided. Take these offerings, O Lord, that we give and use them for your kingdom and your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us stand together as citizens of heaven and affirm our faith in unison. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Wherever we go, we are citizens of heaven, and the Lord is with us. Wherever we go, let us stand and sing 668, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Go with 